How does the intensity of a light source affect the softness of the shadows it casts? Hello world, my name is Matt Spa, and I'm a photographer, videographer, and seemingly, like everyone else, a guy with a lot of time on his hands right now. I'm trying to use this time to answer some questions and figure some things out, and today I'm trying to answer a question that I think intuitively I already know the answer to, but that I've never really tested to try to figure it out. And that is, how does the intensity or the brightness of my key light affect the quality of light that I get on my subject, or the shadows that it casts and the fall off. There's a million lighting tutorials on YouTube. There's probably more than a million. And I've watched a lot of them. And there's a couple of things that they always seem to leave out. And one is the intensity of the light. A lot of times they'll tell you what light source they're using, but they don't tell you what percentage it's set to. And the other thing that often seems to get left out is the distances of things and angles. So for this experiment, and just for the sake of clarity, I'm going to try to give you as much information as I can about how far away from everything, everything else is, and exactly what my camera settings are. First, let's talk about the setup and kind of where everything is here. Using my tape measure and my, uh, it's not a compass. What's the thing that measures angles? Not a compass. Uh, protractor. Using my protractor and my tape measure, I can tell you with absolute certainty that the wall behind me is four feet away. The camera lens in front of me is five feet away, and the light source is three feet away. That measurement, that measurement is from my face to the layer of diffusion that I have in this softbox. So if you want to get technical, the actual light source is another 38 inches away because it's in a 38 inch parabolic softbox. So the light source is six feet away. The layer of diffusion is three feet away, four feet off the background, five feet to the camera. In terms of equipment, I am using a Klar Alumamax 300 as my primary and only light source. It is coming through a glow 38 inch deep parabolic softbox that has a textured silver interior and a single layer of diffusion on it. My camera is the Sony a7 III. My lens is the Tamron 28 to 75 set at 50 millimeters. Settings for this entire experiment will of course remain the same as I mentioned except ISO and light intensity. I'm shooting at 24 frames per second which makes my shutter speed 1 50th of a second. Aperture is f4. I'm shooting 4K footage at 100 megabits, but I publish in 1080, so the ultimate footage that you see here will be 1080p. Last thing to talk about is white balance, and I will set the white balance for each segment that I do, and then just publish either as a super or a voiceover what that white balance change is. This light is not super accurate. It's a 5600K light, but it usually reads down in the 53 to 51 by the time you get a modifier on it. So I'll just make sure to publish that. I'll be using this color checker video from X-Rite to do all of that. I just made a video on this about how to get consistent and accurate color, and I'll link that up here or down below. If you're not using some kind of reference to do that, I highly recommend you do. This will save you a ton of headaches in post-production. So with everything in place and camera set, let's start this little experiment. <sighs> Time has passed and much footage has been shot and dumped and looked at and compared and it's just not working. The footage, it's either me trying to hold this and then talk or it's me with this on a light stand and then tripping over it and knocking stuff over. And it's just not working. And so I'm going to have to employ a secret weapon that I use here in the studio and I don't really like people to know about it and I suggest that if you have this secret weapon, you probably want to keep a lid on it, but there's no way around it. I'm going to have to use a mannequin and doggone it, mannequins are creepy. There's just, there's no two ways about it. Once people know you have a mannequin or they see one in your studio, it just, it puts a little creep sticker on you. I'm sorry, but they're awesome in terms of learning stuff. I once wanted to make a video about the, the one piece of gear that I bought that taught me more than any other thing about photography. And that piece of gear was this $60 mannequin that I bought because they don't sweat and they don't complain and they sit perfectly still. And so for something like this, they're just awesome. So I'm gonna start shooting these sequences now and you'll get to meet Vicky. 
So if having a mannequin is creepy, I'm sure that naming your mannequin is exponentially more creepy. In my defense, I didn't actually name Tricky Vicky. My neighbor next door did. And he named her after a girl that he'd known in his younger days who I would guess was probably of questionable morals. But that was a long time ago, and her namesake here does an excellent job of sitting still and will allow us to get a really good comparison of different intensities and different ISO settings. If we take a look at this footage, we can see with the light at 100%, our ISO sits firmly at 100. When the light output is reduced to 75%, ISO has to jump to 125. The light at 50%, ISO is at 200. The light at 25%, ISO jumps to 320. And finally, with the light at 10% of its full output, the ISO jumps to 500. When I look across these, I see almost no variation to my eye. And they've been color corrected, so everything has been adjusted so that the exposure swatches on the color checker are reading at 100 and 0, so white and black, respectively. And the color swatches have been tweaked using the hue and saturation tools just for accuracy. But even before tweaking, they were consistent. If I look at the Lumiscope, that's the only place that I start to see something different here. And what I see is really just a kind of gradual shift in the midtones downward. So the midtones get slightly darker as the light intensity decreases and the ISO increases. Here's a second look at just the 100% down to 25% intensity clips. These are blown up 150% for us to try to look and see if we can see a difference in the fall off of the shadow. So I'm looking at the light that's coming across her cheek. I'm looking at the light underneath the chin, on the side of the nose, in the eye sockets, etc. And again, I'm just not seeing any kind of appreciable difference. I have to admit that that's actually the result that I thought I was going to get. But something made me doubt myself, and it was a video that I saw that was produced by a very popular YouTuber. It was a kind of behind the scenes thing of how I make my videos. And in there, he specifically said that he reduced the intensity of his light and raised his ISO in order to get softer shadows across his face. I did not see that, and I kind of thought I would because I have great respect for this guy. And I'm not mentioning who it is because I'm not trying to start a fight or say that he's wrong or anything else. He may have a different light source. There may be some component of this that I'm missing. But in the, in the testing that I did, I saw no difference whatsoever. And like I say, that's what I thought I would get. Light intensity and ISO are directly proportionate. Now, as you decrease the intensity of your light, you can affect the light that's traveling to your backdrop or background, depending on that distance. That's inverse square law. That's a whole different kind of kettle of fish than what we're talking about here. But anyway, that was the, that's the thing that I did today. And I made a video about it and now I'm putting it out there. And if you like this kind of video, subscribe and like and thumbs up and follow and whatever else you do on YouTube. Tell two friends, uh, thanks for watching this one. I will see you in the next one.